What's up everyone? To celebrate the release of my new Shopify theme developer course for existing web developers, I'm finally answering a common question I seem to be getting lately, which is what is it I actually do as a Shopify theme developer? But first, just to give you a quick overview of this new course I've just released, it's basically everything someone with existing skills in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript needs to know in order to transition into the lucrative niche of Shopify development, whether that be to work on your own e-commerce store or unlock a new specialization as a developer. Inside the course, I cover what you need to understand about the Shopify platform, teach you all you need to know about Shopify Liquid, and then show you how JavaScript is used in Shopify themes in depth. So if you wanna check out the course, the link of course is the first one in the description. But now back to the topic of this video. So there's a few categories of people who ask me what it is I do. And obviously one of those categories are people that have never even heard of Shopify before, to which I have to explain that Shopify is an easy to use e-commerce platform that helps sellers of any size or scale sell online. Then there are those that don't really understand what web development is. It's not UX design, it's not UI design, it's not copywriting, it's not even website management. It's the actual building the writing of the code that actually creates what you're looking at when you navigate a website. So with a basic understanding of those two ideas, the two most common questions I seem to get asked are, so you build websites on Shopify? And two, do sellers really need help from a developer? In my video on Shopify themes, free, paid or custom, I answer the question of whether I'm typically building Shopify websites from scratch, to which the answer is a resounding no. As you're probably aware, you can open a Shopify account today and it comes with a pretty nice theme. Or if you want something more premium, you can just buy an off the shelf theme for around three to 400 bucks. So I totally understand where this question is coming from, but you gotta understand guys that Shopify is not just a platform for drop shipping solopreneurs. There are some some pretty massive brands that host their websites on Shopify. Some notable examples include Gymshark, Red Bull, and Kylie Cosmetics. These are all either billion dollar brands or near billion dollar brands using Shopify as their e-commerce platform. Personally, I have worked in-house for Australian brands like High Smile and Ringers Western. Perhaps not world famous brands, but businesses that employ tens of staff in various departments. So do you really think that these brands just install a premium theme for 400 bucks and call it a day? No, in some cases actually, they employ full-time staff to work on the website. So if you do want a full-time job as a developer, there's some opportunity there to be full-time employed by one of these companies, but there's also a huge range of sellers that might not need or want to hire a developer full-time, but still need help with their website and have a budget for it. But getting back to the original topic of this video, what is it I actually do? for these Shopify sellers? Well, the answer is that it varies, of course, but there are two categories that I'll break down for you in this video. Number one, implementing custom designs, and number two, coming up with technical solutions on Shopify. There is some overlap between the two, but to talk about them one by one, what I mean by implementing custom designs is that the client has a specific idea of how they want the website to look, and therefore they can't just use an off-the-shelf theme they'll need something custom built for them. A common misconception that people have about me is that I personally design the websites that I work on, which is simply not the case. Instead, I usually receive the designs in Figma format and build according to the designs. Now, you might think that this is quite simple, so much that it might not require someone with development knowledge, but you could be wrong for the following reasons. Number one, website mockups on a program like Figma are usually provided at only two screen widths desktop and mobile, typically 1440 pixels and 390 pixels. These designs are created at a fixed width and don't communicate how exactly the website is supposed to respond at various window widths. For example, let's take a look at this hero section. You can see here that at 1440 pixels, the text starts at around 195 pixels from the left and 216 pixels from the top. On mobile, this text starts at around 45 pixels from the left, and let's say to keep it simple, 120 pixels from the top on mobile, disregarding this mobile navigation here. So do we just choose a breakpoint at around 768 and on desktop have the text start from 195 pixels from the left, and on mobile, 45 pixels from the left? The answer is no, but let's assume for now that the answer is yes. So for now, I'll add in those fixed values to my CSS. 
In addition to these spacings, there's also some space below the text content until the bottom of the background image to account for as well. Not to mention the word wrapping, which we'll get to as well. Okay, so let's add in 216 pixels of padding to the bottom and add break tags into the HTML to force the line breaks. If we set our browser width to exactly 1440 pixels wide, you'll see this looks pretty good. If we then set our browser to 390 pixels, again, looks okay. We just have a problem with the background image as we're not seeing any of the model anymore. We'll need to add some padding to the right as well. So let's do that now. Okay, that fixes the issue with the padding on the right. Now for the image to get it looking like the design at 390 pixel screen width, we can actually use background positioning to move it into place. There we go. Now we have an issue with the word wrapping. Remember on desktop, we set the text to break onto a new line in between the words A and small. In the mobile design, however, the line break is occurring after the comma here. Because we've added in the line break using HTML, there's not much we can do here besides creating an alternative HTML element and toggling the div elements based on whether the user is on desktop or mobile. This is not recommended. With this particular example, it's not too bad actually. The main problem is the image on desktop. Desktop is often harder to get right because screen widths have a massive range on desktop, whereas on mobile browsers, they are usually fixed to be full widths on a limited number of possibilities when it comes to device dimensions. With this particular example, you could almost get away with absolute margins and paddings, but what happens if we add some more complexity to the design? Now let's look at this hero design with a split background. As the content here appears to be in the first square and the second square is just an image, we might think to put the content within the first square. Dialing in the fixed paddings of 140 pixels left and right and 160 pixels top and bottom for the content container, we can see that this looks about right at the canvas size of 1440 pixels. But what about if we extend the screen width further than 1440 pixels? Now you can see that there is some white space appearing on the right. If we contract the window to somewhere between 768 and 1440, we're now starting to lose a significant portion of that second image. Obviously this is not ideal, but let's make this design even more complex by adding content to the second square. All I've done here is I've added the same content from the first square into the second, and at 1440 pixels, you can see this doesn't really work anymore. Okay, but maybe my paddings are a bit too big, so let's reduce them down from 140 to 81. Okay, great. Looks good on 1440. Let me resize my window and oh, oh yikes. This really doesn't work well at other screen sizes. And this is because we coded our hero with fixed values. As a developer, you need to be able to look at the design and determine how best to code it so that it's flexible across many screen sizes. So back to our example, let's remove all of these fixed paddings and instead wrap each bundle of content in its own responsive container. We'll give some base level padding to this container class so that the container is never flush against the edges of its parent container, add an automatic margin and set the width of the container to fit the content inside of it. Now, if we resize the screen, you can see that the margins get bigger on larger screen sizes and shrink on smaller screen sizes, all the way down to zero margins with just that 10 pixels of padding so that it's never clashing against the side of the parent container. Next, we need that content to center vertically within the square, so I'll use Flexbox for that. You'll now see that this is quite responsive on screen sizes above 1110, but below 1110 pixels, it's getting a little tight. And at this point, I might just make an arbitrary breakpoint to reduce the font size to about 45 pixels of the heading. That now gives us a lot of extra room to work with until around 850 pixels. Here we might decide to increase the mobile breakpoint to 850 pixels, but in this case, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just going to set another arbitrary breakpoint to reduce the font size to 36 pixels below 850, but still jumping back to 40 pixels on mobile as per the rule set here in the media query for under 768. So from 768 all the way up to 1792 pixels, which is the max my browser will go to on my MacBook Pro, this is looking good. Now to check mobile, you can see we definitely have some problems under 768, but this is a very common issue with an easy fix. On mobile, we can just change the flex direction to column, and now our columns will switch from stacking horizontally to stacking vertically. At 390 pixels, this is looking okay. Under 330, it's starting to look a little congested again, but given that less than 2% of users are on phones that small, I'm not gonna worry about that just for now. 
As you can see guys, a lot of decisions around responsiveness. As a developer, the designer might come up with this beautiful layout at a fixed screen width, but it's generally up to the developer to add in a responsive structure that works on every screen size, hence the term responsive web development. If you remember my last video, I tried to take a Figma design and automatically convert it to HTML and CSS code on Shopify. And it didn't really work because I had to remove all of the absolute pixel positioning and restructure the content to fit into responsive containers anyway. This is something a lot of non-technical people forget about websites. So number one, you need to build the front end of a website in a particular way so that it responds well to various screen sizes. But in terms of Shopify specifically, the front end also needs to be coded so that it's flexible enough to respond to changes in dynamic content as well. A super common and basic example of this is the decision on what happens in a section of the theme that assumes an image, but an image for that resource just doesn't exist. Usually we just remove the HTML element from the page if the required resource doesn't exist, which in the case of images, removes this ugly looking error. But then what do we do if the loss of an image is going to throw off the visual flow of the other elements if the space is not utilized? Perhaps in this case, we put in a placeholder image that is the same size as the other images. This is just one simple example. But not only do we need to ensure that the theme code is robust enough to respond to various theme editor settings, we may also need to decide on or create new data structures to existing objects or create new objects. I'm talking about meta fields and meta objects here. For instance, let's take this simple section here. We can pull this image here from the featured image of the product. We can pull this text here from the title, dynamically load the product URL into this button, and we can pull the price to be displayed within the button text here. But where is this particular piece of text gonna pull from? Here I need to discuss with the merchant where this information should pull from. Do they have a meta field set up for this already? If not, I might have to create it for them, making sure to communicate with the client that they will be responsible for maintaining the value of this field ongoing and for multiple products. That's an easy example of how a simple piece of content in the provided designs can spark a conversation around how to solve a technical problem, but it can get much more complicated than that. Which brings me to my second category, which is implementing technical solutions. This covers any problem relating to the front end of the website that the client might have. Often this involves using domain expertise to help educate and advise the client while at the same time setting up data structures and building new features into the theme. Here's an example of something a client came to me with recently. This particular client needed a few objects that didn't exist in Shopify and presented mockups to me on how he'd like his website to operate on the front end. As you might know, the concept of categories and subcategories as a way to organize products in Shopify doesn't exist. Instead, you have collections, which could not be nested within one another and any product can exist within multiple collections. That system didn't really work well for this client who wanted his customers to be able to drill down from the top level category of books down to a very specific category like children's alligator and crocodile books. As you can see here, we implemented this breadcrumb structure by creating new meta objects we named collection groups and linking them to native collections. We also created a new meta object definition for authors with a meta field link to link an author to the product that they authored. You can see here that the animals collection contains both sub collections and products. Products being native in Shopify, but sub collections had to be coded in as a meta field and I had to write some bespoke liquid to determine how this structure would display in the breadcrumbs, which was a very important requirement for the client. So you can see here that there's a lot more than you might have thought about how to implement bespoke designs and solutions on Shopify. Now, of course, for a lot of sellers, they might not come across many of these challenges at all, or are simply just happy to conform to whatever is standard in Shopify and from the pre-built theme that they bought of the Shopify theme store. But remember guys, that there are over 4 million Shopify stores worldwide with the top 10% earning over 10K per month. That's over 400K six-figure Shopify sites. So just because none of your friends on Shopify ever had to hire a developer, doesn't mean that there isn't a need out there for them. And for those of you with existing front-end skills, of course, I'm gonna spruik my own course, the bridging course for existing developers that you can find on shopifythemedeveloper.com. You can find that in the first link of the description. I hope this video gave you some insight into what theme developers actually do and cleared up a lot of confusion. If not, drop a comment below and I can elaborate further on some of these ideas. Also, for those of you on Instagram and TikTok, I just started posting content on the official Instagram account of shopifythemedeveloper.com. So head over to Shopify Theme Developer on both platforms and hit follow for some regular short form content and send me a DM. I'd be happy to hear from you on either one of those accounts. As always, drop a like if you gained something from this video and I'll see you on the next one.